Oh my gosh. Hi everyone. I'm Liz Hoddle. I'm the Director of Events and Marketing at Politics and Prose Bookstore. And it is such an honor to welcome you to listen to Margaret Atwood and Rebecca Traster to celebrate the release of the Testaments. Applause. It's a really special treat to be in this really beautiful, beautiful theater. I don't know if you know, but um, the Lincoln Theater has been in operation for over 100 years, and women like Billie Holiday and Sarah Vaughan played here in their heyday. It's just, it's, it, seem, it seems right. And we're also in a town who this week was rocked awake by the youth trying to wake us up, and you can feel that. I think you can feel that too. At Politics and Prose, we program over a thousand events a year in the DC area, at our three stores, and at venues all over town. We work tirelessly because we believe in our mission, in the sanctity of intellectual freedom, that real, difficult, honest writing and conversations are crucial to a democratic society, and that they're, they're worth paying full price for. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support independent bookstores. <laughs> Margaret Atwood is one of the most singular voices of our time. The span of her work is just extraordinary, including 17 books of poetry, 10 books of nonfiction, eight collections of short stories, and 16 novels, including Ailey's Grace, The Blind Assassin. Yeah, okay, let's go. The Robber Bride, the Oryx and Craig trilogy, and the Booker Award winning, the sorry, Blind Assassin. I fell in love personally with Margaret Atwood when I was a teenager through her novel Cat's Eye about the scars of complicated female friendship. Yeah, applaud that one too, yeah. If you've come to her through your, her amazing speculative fiction, please don't limit yourself there. There's so much other rich work. In women's friendship, just like the future of political systems, Margaret Atwood sees more acutely than anyone else. In the 1985 Handmaid's Tale was published, and the world marveled at her imaginative dystopian vision, but slept well knowing it couldn't happen to us, this madhouse of renewed patriarchy and women's loss of control over their own bodies. Don't clap now. In 2017, the award-winning television show expanded the world of Gilead and created a whole new audience for her vision. And now in the Testament, she returns to Gilead on her own terms. I know you are receiving your copies for the first time tonight, and I don't want to tell you anything. I just want to tell you it will not disappoint you. Um, it, it won't. It's, I'm just calling sick on Monday because you're going to be busy. There was only one person in the world that I wanted in conversation with Margaret Atwood tonight. In her books, All the Single Ladies and Good and Mad, Rebecca Traister systematically broke apart assumptions about women's cultural and emotional experience. I don't know about how many, just tell me, how many times have you felt that like steaming anger at the day's news, but all you can do is like sit at your desk and grunt, right? And you open up the, right? And you open up the cut and Rebecca has taken that anger and held it close and crystallized it for you. Through her fiction, Margaret Atwood gives a structure, a plot, a body and a map to our collective fury. And through her compassionate analysis, Rebecca Traster shows us a path forward. Again and again in her work, Margaret Atwood reminds us that there is nothing more dangerous to patriarchy than two women really talking. So, look out!
Hello. <laughs> Hello to everybody. I'm actually going to start in a way that I didn't expect to start, but um, I'm going to start with a question from the crowd um, because it was the first one that I looked at, and it comes uh, from Rachel, who's age 11. And she wants to know, as a kid slash teen, what books did you read that specifically inspired you to become a writer? Yeah. As a kid slash teen. Okay. <laughs> she, I, should, I should say that she adds, I love The Handmaid's Tale. It is very relevant to politics right now. Okay. Um, thank you, Rachel. When, when I was 11, I wasn't thinking of becoming a writer. Uh, and I didn't really get into it until I was 16. But in between being 11 and 16, I read a lot of books. Um, so I was reading a lot of um, sci-fi. I was reading 1984. I was reading Brave New World. I was reading uh, Ray Bradbury when he was being published in the, in the 50s. And I was reading a writer called John Wyndham, who wrote a number of these um, dystopia. So those are probably directly applicable to The Handmaid's Tale. But I was also reading everything else. I was at a pash on Sherlock Holmes when I was 11. It seemed like I'm a safe kind of person to have a pash on because he wasn't very interested in personal relationships. But he had lots of adventures. Uh, so I liked reading about him. I read a lot of comic books. They were the forbidden thing of the um, 40s and early 50s because we didn't have television um, much yet. So they were the things your parents disapproved of, so of course I read lots of them. And, uh, and I read quite a few trashy books uh, when I was babysitting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, it's best place. Yeah. Yes, best place. Mm -hmm. Other people's trashy Other people's books. Other people's trash, yeah. <laughs> parents yeah. didn't know you were reading. Right. And... Um, I read something called Donovan's Brain, which made the only use of French poetry for the elimination of evil super brains that I've ever read, <laughs> and it stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And also all of the classics. So I was reading Jane Austen, and I was reading uh, the Brontes, and George Eliot, and also quite a lot of Thomas Hardy. For some reason, our school system thought Thomas Hardy was good for you. So, you read that too? Yeah. Um, so, all of the above, plus a lot of modern American, uh, modern at that time American uh, writing, although some of that came a bit later. So, Hemingway, Faulkner, uh, Fitzgerald, etc. I read Catherine Mansfield, I was keen on her, and detective stories a lot. So, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Agatha Christie, Nio Marsh, all of those kinds of books I liked. I liked ones with maps at the front. <laughs> Tolkien? <laughs> Miss, well, Tolkien, yes, I read yeah. Tolkien. A little bit later, oddly mm. enough. Um, but I had a good background for Tolkien because I had a large repertoire of um, mythology and, and fairy tales. So quite a, quite a bit, and I, I don't think it was any one book. It was, it was books in general, and because I did spend a lot of time in the woods, the book was the art form that I knew best. Mm -hmm. So short on the movies, long on the books. Mm. One of the reasons that Rachel's question jumped out at me is because um, it was very close to a question I was planning to ask based on my own experience as an 11-year-old reader. You can remember that. <laughs> I, well, I can in this instance. Yeah, tonight, right. I do remember this. Okay. Because as an 11-year-old reader, um, the very first contemporary, I had read, I think, Jane Eyre. I had read, I'd read some Austen. Maybe I'd read Pride and Prejudice at that point. But I, you know, the very first contemporary novel that I read was The Handmaid's Tale. And it was the summer that I was 11, which was the summer that it was out. And I read it in hardback and I sort of pilfered it from my aunt uh, during a summer vacation, 
took it from my aunt's bedside. And I remember to this day my mother and my aunt exchanging a look, a silent look, as they saw me sitting there um, of concern, which m made me exceedingly happy. I was clear. <laughs> um, and I have thought a lot in retrospect about the impact that it made because I cannot imagine, I was not a worldly 11 year old, I cannot imagine that I understood much of anything that I was reading and the thing that stayed with me most strongly was the use of butter as a moisturizer. Um, really, it really, that i never forget it. Um, and when I went back and read it again, as a teenager, and I've, I've read it several times since, um, I've thought, my God, what did, what did I understand about this at 11? Um, but I know that it was a page turner. And while I wouldn't have thought that I understood enough to have it inform my political worldview, I also consider that immediately after putting it down, the next book I picked up, hooked on contemporary adult fiction, was Isabel Allende's The House of the Spirits, um, which is also about political, a political regime, its rise and fall, um, and the impact that, that, that the politics has on the personal. And again, I think I understood that to be like General Hospital, which I also loved at 11. <laughs> but, but, my, but I think in retrospect that those, my 11-year-old reading experiences probably did set me to some degree on a path in which I was engaged in politics. And my question to you was going to be, in addition to the, to the comic books and the novels and the science fiction um, and the detective stories, as a kid slash teen, how did you come to political consciousness? Was it through the news? Was it through history? I'm really, really old. <laughs> so, so that means I was born in 1939, two months after Canada entered World War II. So I grew up surrounded by that imagery, um, people that one knew, relatives, etc. I mean, everybody was involved, mm -hmm. and the the iconography, the the cigarette cards you collected with all of the airplanes on, mm -hmm. um, you know that that was just all around. And I realized that uh, when I went to high school, which would have been 1951, it was only about six years after that war had ended, mm -hmm. and our history teacher had been in it. Um, he was very keen on showing us documentaries, propaganda documentaries of, of World War II. So we were very, very conscious of um, Hitler in particular, but the, all of those war things. And I read the Winston Churchill memoirs as they were coming out, mm -hmm. and also quite a few other books about how that all came to be, and people are still are still writing books about that because it was so epic. I, I was just reading um, one about the siege of Stalingrad uh, quite recently, and I, I don't think we'll ever see another war quite like that because um, there are now satellites and drones, so you, you could not have done the D-Day invasion today without people knowing about it. But it was a pretty endless fascination to me and the entire uh, history of the Cold War. Like, how did that happen? What was the trajectory of it? I just read a book recently called The House of Government. Mm. It's by a man called Yuri Slezkine, and it's the history of an apartment building in Moscow that the Bolsheviks built when they had won as a symbol of the utopia that was about to arrive. Um, and. <laughs> It was built in a part of Moscow called the Swamp, and in order to build it, they had to drain the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Stalin started purging people, which he did in the early 30s, that was also called draining the swamp. Mm. So that's the origin of that metaphor, in case you were wondering. Here we are in the swamp. And here you are <laughs> in the swamp. Yeah, there you are. Anyway, the, the way these things move through their cycles, and that was... Of course, um, one of the things I'm interested in in, in the, the Testaments, because in the Testaments we're further along in the uh, Gileadian regime, and we're no longer in the first flush of ideological 
um, uh, excitement. So if you think of what happened, for instance, in the New England colonies, the the first generation were filled with the zeal of the Lord, and they had all met him personally in the cornfield. Mm -hmm. And that was a... Uh, that was the entry ticket for being a full-fledged um, member of the church and part of the hierarchy. Second generation didn't have such so many personal encounters, so they had to change the rules. Otherwise, they would have run out of people. And that's what happened. Second generation is different, and by the time you get to the third, you're into quite different territory. I want to talk to you about generational tension. Because it is, I, I don't want to give away. It's very hard to have this conversation and you can give without, away without a bit. spoilers. Yeah, okay. But I think anybody in here who has read anything about the book will know that some of the characters are they're young women, one young women who were born in Gilead and raised in Gilead, and then there is the generation, especially the aunts, who were part of the formation of Gilead. And I was deeply struck by the generational tension. And I'm going to, if it's all right with you, I'm going to read two passages. Um, one is from one of the, one is one of these young women who was raised in Gilead, who says the founders and the older aunts had edges to them. They'd been molded in an age before Gilead. They'd had struggles. We had been spared and these struggles had ground off the softness that once might have been there. But we hadn't been forced to undergo such ordeals. We'd been protected. We hadn't needed to deal with the harshness of the world at large. We were the beneficiaries of the sacrifices made by our forebears. We were constantly reminded of this and ordered to be grateful. But it is difficult to be grateful for the absence of an unknown quantity. And this passage reminded me very powerfully of a passage in The Handmaid's Tale, which is uh, when Alfred remembers her mother being upset and saying, I don't think I have the exact quote, but she remembers her mother saying to her, you're the backlash. Mm -hmm. You don't know what we went through. You don't understand the experiences we had, and so you can afford not to care. And I think about how these are inverse situations. One is you were born with all the benefits of liberation, and so you have no idea of what it was like before. And one is you were born within a protectionate and patriarchal world with none, with no liberty, you have no idea what it was before. Is this a cycle that repeats in every context on and on forever <laughs> till it's all over? Or is part of the challenge to create some kind of coming to terms between, ge between generations of activists, feminists, women? Well, I think you're going to really have to try to do that because I've seen this cycle run through a couple of times now. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had the, um, we had the suffragettes. Mm -hmm. They got the vote. What more do you want? Mm -hmm. Plus you can smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. What's your problem? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 then we had, um, the women, uh, during World War II who had jobs and money and quite a lot of freedom, etc. Um, because they were needed. You know, working in factories, making bombs, you know, how you wish to spend your life. But, um, but you did have pocket money. Mm -hmm. You had money. You were viewed with respect as an earner. And then in the 50s, there was a concerted, orchestrated attempt to get women back into the home. And the big thing you were supposed to have was a bungalow, uh, an open plan bungalow with no doors you could close, <laughs> and um, a washer, dryer, and four kids. Mm -hmm. Um, I was the generation right after that, but I saw that going through. And the and the 60s feminists were reacting against that, against the idea that you shouldn't really have a mind of your own. Um, and if you went to college, it was so you could make intelligent dinner party conversation with your husband's business friends. Uh, and that was the line. That was what was put out there. You can go back and look in the magazines and see. I have, yeah. And largely in, in America, Canada was such a cultural backwater that uh, we didn't get the full dose. Plus, we had a, a magazine called Chatelaine, which was run by an early um, 
feminist, though she didn't call herself that, called Doris Anderson. And she was putting into that magazine under the noses of the <laughs> people who actually were supposed to be controlling it, who were all men. Um, she was putting in articles of 10 years earlier than those subjects were, would appear in American magazines. So I grew up reading that. Plus I had a mother who was a tomboy uh, from probably the 20s and 30s, and she was just not interested in the 50s open plan bungalow washer dryer <laughs> model. She was not interested in that at all. Can't imagine uh, she not. wanted to be canoeing. Um, so, so, so that's sort of where I came from in relation to all of all of this. And um, where were we? We were at yeah. how it, how we work it out. Because how do you work it out? Okay, so I think you work it out through through bridge figures because I I don't don't think these are sealed compartments. Oh, uh, you can say that people are representative of their generation, but they are not limited to being that. And there's a lot of people who are uh, quite capable of talking to um, other people who are not in their age group. I recommend it <laughs> both ways. Both ways you can learn a lot. Um, so so I I think. Through that, and through identifying common um, goals, objectives, and and um, ideals, so we can we can usually start with something quite basic, and everybody can can vote on that. And I usually start with our women, human beings, <laughs> you know. And and if we vote on that, and and if we, if we agree on that, then we can go on from there. Uh, in my uh, so in, in the early uh, 70s, there was quite a lot of uproar about what you should wear, whether you should wear a dress. You traitor, you've got one on. I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no makeup, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was a lot of uh, fuss about those things. Mm -hmm. To me, those are details. I think women, I think anybody should just wear whatever they like. And uh, other people should not sh should not be d judgmental about it, but they always are because cl clothing is very symbolic. Um, but why have a fuss about whether or not you've got overalls on? I would rather have a fuss about whether you've got human rights. Mm. The fusses seem to be to me often um, tactically useful for those who oppose the broader goal like human rights, that people can be distracted by the intergenerational fights and that very often we need the zeal, of, the zeal and the naivete of youth along with the experience and awareness of how bad things can be of an elder generation. Well, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, you can easily just segue off into going Oh, you don't know how good you've got it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. When I was young, we didn't, et cetera, fill in the right. blank. Uh, I, so, and, so when I was 11, I was asking my mom, you don't remember this because you're too young, but there was this ad, and it was for a sanitary napkin product mm -hmm. called Modess. And it would show a woman in a long, shimmering white evening gown overlooking mm -hmm. the Adriatic Ocean. <laughs> and uh, the thing would say, Modest, dot, 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 because. <laughs> that was the ad. So, 11-year-old <laughs> to, to mother, because what? <laughs> Never mind. I'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so you don't remember that, no. No, I don't remember Modest, but I do, I want to ask you about the iconography that you mentioned, the shimmering white gown. The shimmering gowns, white gown, um, yeah. And the aesthetics of totalitarianism, because um, the aesthetics matter, right? And the iconography matters, the colors matter, the oh, dress matters. Yeah, very, and it's yeah. mattered very much to how, your, how particularly Gilead has been received and interpreted by those who've read it and want to express their feelings and thoughts about it. Yeah, so let us say that every human culture has always been interested in clothing. <laughs> it's not a minor detail. And a lot of them have made rules about it. 
So in Rome, for instance, only aristocrats could wear purple. Um, in 4,000 uh, 4, years ago, the Code of Hammurabi said only aristocratic women could wear veils. And if you were a non-aristocratic woman and you were caught wearing a veil, the penalty was death. Yeah, wear veils. You, you, you have the freedom to wear them. Get those veils on right now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't appreciate it. Uh, so, <laughs> so and, and that goes on through, through history. I, I think our age is probably the one right now where it's least possible to deduce a person's social standing in this culture right now from what they might have on, unless you were a very... Uh, a stringent observer of brands, mm. brands, which I am not mm. particularly. Yeah. No, apparently they have a lot of significance. Um, <laughs> They've grown in significance as I've become less able to recognize them exactly. in all their shapes, <laughs> <That's> so, <laughs> <the problem. laughs> which I think might also be about generational shift. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it is important, and, and totalitarian regimes put a lot of stress on outfits, uniforms, outfits, uniformity, and uh, dividing people into classes. You've, you've probably seen Triumph of the Will. I have. Yeah, so, so everybody was in this uh, movement, even, peop even ditch diggers had their uniform with their shovel, to dump, to dump, to dump, present arms, it was a shovel. Uh, so that goes on in them, and it is continuing to go on in them, to, though probably not to the extent that it did at its height, which was um, the mid-20th century. Outfits were big. My feeling about Hitler is that if they'd let him into art school, none of this would have happened. <laughs> What he really wanted to do, to do was design the rallies. Mm. That was his big. He was very keen on the uniforms, the flags, the rallies, the appearances, the buildings, all of that. So you're quite right, very important. Uh, but important also to the people who are putting, putting these outfits on mm -hmm. because it makes you feel that you're part of something or other. And you have talked... So the iconography of the, of the world that you created here, of Gilead, has become very important to protest culture now. And smartly so, because, uh, <laughs> because you, can, you can be there, but, and, and you can't get kicked out because you're not creating a disturbance. You're not saying anything. You're very modestly looking down at your folded hands. And um, you're, you also cannot be expelled for being immodestly dressed because every part of you is covered up. So there you are, but you're very visible and it's perfect for television. With the radio, it wouldn't work so well. <laughs> <laughs> Although the use of the handmaids costumes as protest tactic preceded the Hulu television it did, show. Yes. And and that's something and and I remember being startled because I was somehow, I don't know how, I think I was distracted at the time. It was early 2017. I didn't know that the television show was coming. And the first time that I saw the handmaids at a protest, it took my breath away because again for me this was like precious text that was my first feminist text, even though I probably didn't understand it that way at the time. And here it was being brought to life in this crucial emergency moment. And I didn't know that it was coming into mass popular culture. So that even without the television broadcast of The Handmaid's Outfits, the the iconography of it from the cover of the book mm -hmm. and, the, and the text itself That's was true. so powerful that it could sort of rock me and many other people in advance of seeing Elizabeth Moss in it. It's true, but it had had a number of incarnations before. It had been a film, it had right. been um, an opera, mm. uh, and it had been, and it's now a graphic novel, but that came a bit later. So the people 
new, also from the cover, a number of different covers, a number of different iterations of the same basic idea of, in many different countries. So it was, it was out there already. Um, it was Texas where it first uh, made an appearance in a legislature. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they, they got this idea, they sent away for the outfits, but when they arrived, they were pink. So they, so they very swiftly sewed some that were red. And there they were, and it could, it's a shot that could have been right out of the television show because it's a bunch of men in dark suits signing into law, um, some laws about, um, other human beings with um, problems they themselves will never have mm. unless something gets quite radically rearranged. <laughs> as an author, I know that you want to be read by as many people as possible, I presume. Not necessarily, no. no. <laughs> well, I, well, my question is, do you have any anxiety about the mass embrace, for example, of the costumes. And this is something, Gia Tolentino wrote a very smart piece on your book where she gets to some of the anxiety because it's this powerful protest tool. But it is also, as The Handmaid's Tale is now a television series, it is also a Halloween costume. Kylie Jenner threw a birthday party, a Handmaid's oh, Tale birthday party. Oh, there's much more than you know. Much more than you know. For instance, it has been something called the hand soap's tail, in which somebody put a little red dress on a hand soap plus a bonnet on the thing you squeeze. And I have a lot of pictures of people whose dogs have had things wrong with their necks, and they have the white thing on, and people, <laughs> people think it's fun to put a little red cape on. Um, it's it's been that um, seems very layered in a lot of ways. Down. That I don't calm know. down, <laughs> calm down. It's also quite a funny thing called. Finally, they've made a Handmaid's Tale for men, which is pretty smart. It's by a group called Funny or Die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's been a piece by a Scottish uh, stand-up artist uh, called If the Handmaid's Tale Were Scottish, which, <laughs> which sort of took off. And then she wrote me this apologetic letter saying, Oh, I didn't I really like it, really. Uh, so you have to think of... <laughs> Now I'll get you later. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what people think I'm going to do to them. Um, so I also have a little knitted chicken in a <laughs> handmaid's tail outfit, and I have a beautiful piece of petty point embroidery from Florida. Thank you, Florida. Uh, the handicrafts people are get going to town on this, I have to tell you. It's made for them. Um, so this is petty point embroidery. It's got a little line of, of ducks across the top and some pink bunny rabbits across the bottom. And in the middle in petty point is F asterisks UK Aunt Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> That's like very so, much in the spirit of the handcrafts, yeah, though, is. that is, is. in Gilead. Is That's what, I mean. what they teach you to do in Gilead. I learn, you know... In a, lot detail. Of, a lot of embroidery. A goes lot of on, embroidery in as Gilead it, as is it in is too. <laughs> yes, as it certainly is too. So there is also a, a concern called Lingua Franca, mm -hmm. which are making oh. some beautiful handcrafted sweaters with proceeds with with slogans. Um, I've got one that says "Praise Be," mm -hmm. um, beautifully embroidered. And proceeds go to Equality Now, mm -hmm. which is the organization we did the launch with, which works on laws concerning women and girls in many countries, working on making them more equitable. So, so her concern is about the kitchification, and I understand her concern, but it is out of my control, mm -hmm. and there's a good side to it as well as a very peculiar side. <laughs> so I, I think the sexy handmaid's Halloween costume <laughs> appeared and then disappeared <laughs> sort of right. the blink of an eye. So people said, well, did you do anything to make that go away? I said, I didn't have to. My mm -hmm. readers did that right. for me. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you, readers. Yeah. It also... 
the fascinating thing that gets to the heart of the Testaments and what makes it um, just such an addictive and compelling and, um, I, I mean, I couldn't believe how much I loved it, I, how much I loved the experience of reading it, um, because it gets to this question that Gia raises in this, which is everybody in the handmaid's costume, there is this question, how many, how many of us would have been handmaids? Mm. How many of us would have been killed? How many of us would have been wives? How many of us would have been econo wives or Martha's or aunts? And this is part of what you are exploring in tremendous um, imaginative and psychological depth in this book. Um, and I think that um, it's one of the, the key things about this moment. What What is all of our roles and what what is complicity look like? Is that part of what drew you to this entry into how you, how you did a sequel to this tremendous book? Okay, so anybody of my generation who has read a lot about what it was like um, to be an occupied country um, and how different kinds of people behaved in different ways, and, and I'm old enough to have known people in resistance movements, um, we all, of course, have asked ourselves, what would we have done? And uh, it's not a simple answer. We, we, we all think we would have been a heroic something or other. Um, that's not necessarily true. And it's, it's also, in those situations, your smorgasbord choices are limited. Mm -hmm. So you don't get to choose, you know, anything you might wish. You've got to choose what is available to you immediately right now. Uh, so how and what the risks are. So how and whether you're putting other people at risk. All of those questions are going to come into play. Uh, so of, of course I've been preoccupied with that for quite a lot of my life. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the answer because none of us know. Do none of us know how we would actually behave. You must have done more thinking about it than most, though. Because I'm older than most, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and because you have put so much creative and imaginative thought into a variety of circumstances. It's, it's true, but I, but I also knew people who were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't simple. Uh, there's a resistance museum in France, and you go into it, and they approach the question very carefully because um, not all of these resistance actions were appreciated, especially when it turned out that that uh, they resulted in everybody in your village getting shot. So, not simple. You've said that you wrote this book... Um in part because you were curious and fascinated by the idea of how regimes fall. Well, I'm hopeful enough to believe that they do fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, you guys are not in a regime like this yet, because if you were, you would not be here, and I would not be here, and you would not be here. No. So you're, you're, you're more in the position of how do you keep it from happening rather than how do you get it to topple. And I wanted to ask you about the value of protest at this juncture, the how at, do you keep it from this happening, this juncture, and how that changes once the regime is installed. Very, very famously, one of the lines that stayed with me always from The Handmaid's Tale is there were marches, but they weren't very big, and lots of people didn't go. Yeah, so what really happened then under Hitler was there weren't any marches because if there had been, you'd have been shot. Mm -hmm. So the people that I'm looking at with great admiration at the moment, moment are those in Hong Kong who have just mm -hmm. kept at it. But they... <laughs> but, but they have not started shooting them yet. Right. Okay. Uh, the, these, you know, the, the Pinochets of this world, I mean, you didn't have those right. protests. And when the, when the Handmaid's Tale first came out, young people were saying to me, well, why didn't they have a march? Why didn't they have a protest? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they, they do that? And it was, it was a real totalitarian regime. Mm -hmm. you, you, any opposition that you were doing had to be covert 
once this thing really got in power, and it only took him about six months uh, to shoot all of his obvious opponents um, and and clear the decks. So that that's when uh, that's when things really clamp down. But that hasn't happened here yet, and I was greatly cheered to see the enormous uh, climate emergency gathering yesterday. Mm -hmm. And and things like that, and the Women's March, mm -hmm. um, do put political pressure on, because because you know about politicians the, the same as, as I do. They respond to... Um, they respond to voter preferences. They also respond to big wads of cash. Mm. Uh, <laughs> don't don't cackle in that ominous way. They, they Things do. are very dark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so the climate protesters may be young, but quite soon they will be able to vote. Mm. And. And any politician who doesn't understand that can't count. Have you been surprised by the fact that the marches have been as big as they are? I've been um, pleased mm -hmm. because people have actually been talking about the uh, climate problems and the environmental problems for a long, long time. I grew up with this stuff. Mm -hmm. It was dinner table conversation, which as a teenager I was bored by. Uh, but it was going on then amongst the biologists, amongst the early environmentalists. It's just that politicians weren't listening because the general populace wasn't into that yet. So the marches are a, are a, are a signal that now people get it. And it means the politicians have to get it or face uh, being defenestrated. <laughs> what do you make of the fact, um, in, a, in a period where globally there's this rise of um, patriarchal and xenophobic um, grasps toward something closer to totalitarian power in all kinds of countries, that the face, one of the faces of the climate movement is a 16-year-old girl. Good for her. Right. <laughs> and I, I loved your answer. Somebody was poking at her about having, about being autistic, and she said, it's a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a, <laughs> extraordinary. And that's in the United States. This is also true of Emma Gonzalez, the, you know, the, the, so many of the people who are leading the massive marches are young, not only young women, young men as well. Um, a lot of people in the resistance were those ages. Uh, and there's, there's a reason for that. Number one, they don't know any better. What am I saying? Uh, <laughs> they, they, they don't understand the kinds of risks that they might actually be running. Um, and, and that is why they're able to do it. But also they don't have dependents. They don't have kids. And once you have kids, you're going to think in a different way. It's just inevitable. Um, somebody called children hostages to fortune. Um, so a lot of the people in the resistance uh, in World War II were, were quite young uh, be, because they, in a way, be, because they, they had the energy, they had the idealism, and, and they didn't have to worry um, about putting children at risk. I'm really struck by the form that this novel takes, which of course follows neatly on the form that The Handmaid's Tale takes, which is it, it is the testimony of three women. It's at just as The Handmaid's Tale was Offred's testimony secreted behind a wall. Um, this book is the testimony of three different women about their experiences within and without Gilead, within and outside of Gilead. And I wonder if you can speak at all about the power of women's storytelling about their own experiences. You say that you, you have said that you write, that to write is to have hope for a future reader. That writing a story is always an act of hope because you're imagining your reader. 
Is that also, is there something about the act of women telling their stories? And of course, we're living in a period in which women telling their stories that they've kept inside for a really long time has been explosive and transformative in some cases. The testimony that they have offered, the literal testimony that they have offered in front of judiciary committees, while not changing an outcome, has touched, I, ho I hope, <laughs> will touch a future. It certainly touched a lot of people. So when you touch people, you touch a future as well. Um, so, so those kinds of testimonies, uh, not only um, hidden manuscripts, manuscripts that people wrote and then hid, uh, but diaries, journals they kept, letters, uh, those kinds of things are immediate. Um, sometimes they're quite boring, but, but they, are <laughs> they are immediate in a way that a manufactured fiction can can imitate, and often does. Um, so I've always been very interested in them. I suppose beginning with Anne Frank, mm -hmm. you know, the, the hidden uh, manuscript. The most extreme example of it that I know is the poet Anna Akhmatova from Russia, who was very silenced during the Stalin regime and. As she was standing in a line outside of prison waiting to see her son, who they had put in there just to annoy her, um, a woman recognized her, a woman in the line recognized her and whispered to her, can you write about this? Mm. And she said, I can. Uh, but she knew that if she wrote about it on paper and that were found, it would that would be it for her. So she she burnt her... Uh, parts of her poem as she wrote them, but she she gave each one of them to a friend of hers who memorized that part. So her poem existed in the memories of a number of different women, none of whom ratted her out, none of whom betrayed her. And when it was safe, she assembled them again and was able to publish the poem. My God. What a story. What a story. But there are a lot of these kinds of stories from those sorts of, of um, regimes. And there are the gaps where there are too few of them. There are, so f there are obviously narratives of enslaved women in the United States, but far too few. Well, often transmitted orally. Yes. Because, as you know, it was illegal for slaves to read and write. Mm -hmm. They made that law so they wouldn't get into any dangerous literature such as the Bible. Right. Right. <laughs> which is which seen which is obviously key to Gilead too, in which women are prevented from reading and writing. Yeah, and that because means, the transmission of experience is inherently dangerous. Well also getting into the Bible is inherently dangerous, mm -hmm. which is why mm -hmm. the church tried to control it so long and for bad vernacular translations. It's a revolutionary document. Mm -hmm. Um you can you can read it various ways, but one of the ways of reading it is um, it's 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 a democratic um, document in in parts, and it's about the liberation of an enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So that's the part they didn't want the slaves getting into, and that's the part that Gilead wants to control because if the women can't read it, they can tell them all sorts of things about mm -hmm. it that aren't actually in it. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn now to some of the other audience questions because we don't want to forget them. Um, did your writing process differ between The Handmaid's Tale and The Testaments? P.S. I love you. That's from Sam. <laughs> P.S. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's always a mess. <laughs> so the the difference was that the personal computer got invented. Mm. <laughs> so instead of having a really messy manuscript, some of which I think you saw, um, which I then would have to give to somebody who can actually type, unlike myself, mm. um, I have the ability to generate a manuscript that looks as if I can type. I was going to say, did you have to? Have you had to learn to type with the invention of the PC? 
No, no, because you don't. You, you can you can go on with the four fingers, which right. is what I use, right. and uh, it it gives you the red underlining mm-hmm. and the green Spell underlining, check. and it saves it, us all. <laughs> well, yeah, the sometimes wrong, but never mind. Um, and you should only ever proofread on on paper because you miss things on the mm-hmm. screen. And it used to have a helpful character on the screen that would do little dances mm-hmm. and twirl. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually, uh, how may I help you, yeah. I would say. You, know, you seem to be having some difficulties here. With <laughs> yeah, well, could you solve the plot problem for me? <laughs> yeah, but they've done away with that, worse luck. I, I enjoyed that little thing, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, kept me company, livened up the day. <laughs> yeah. How long, you you have said and, and you write, uh, in the afterword to the testaments, that this is this has been in your brain <laughs> for th- three and a half decades at this point. Well, in various usually forms. a negative form. I would say, mm. should I? No. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when did you uh, put key to pit finger to key? Okay, when things started, um, I started thinking about it when it became evident that. Um, we weren't going away from Gilead as mm. we appeared to be going in the 90s when it was when the main motif was shopping. Mm. Um, but we were going back towards it, and at the state legislature level, all of these various things were being passed, but also the two uh, Obama elections when the wise Republicans came out with some of the uh, enlightening statements that they came out with such as women who were raped never got pregnant because mm-hmm. their bodies just shut that shut down. down. What were they thinking? Yeah. You can just put an aspirin between your knees. That was birth control. Oh, I, I, I thought it was one. a dime. Yeah. It used it's to be pro- a dime. You know, what's the difference, really? Well, I don't know. I mean, why did the they key. get so cheap? Yeah. It used to be a dime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in advance of the 2016 election. Yeah. Yes. So So things were going... Um, back already. So there would have been, had had we been here in Washington under President Hillary Clinton, there would have been a testaments? Yeah, I think so. Simply because I was interested in the questions that um, that we've talked about already. How do these things end? Um, we had several iterations of the um, Handmaid's Tale in different forms already bef- before all of this in the actual 20th century that was already happening. And so it's been an, an, an ongoing um, motif. Uh, it's been on my mind, my mind for quite a while, and the main thing that's been on my mind is how do these things crumble? You know, what causes them to end? Because we know from Handmaid's Tale that it did end, but we don't know how. Right. Um, of the three narrators, uh, this is from Erica, Erica Lynn, of the three narrators, were any of them harder to write than the others? The hardest one to write was Daisy Nicole. Mm. So the the 16-year-old was the hardest to write. Um, that's the answer that, to that okay. question. <laughs> Why, why was that? Uh, okay, so, so slang is always an issue, and it changes very rapidly. So teenager slang is constantly morphing, and if you put too much in it, you're going to be out of date in about two seconds. But if you don't put any in, the person doesn't sound like a teenager. Um, so... When I was writing Oryx and Crake, I had a young man with commitment problems, and I always sort of, <laughs> I, I always taste taste test these things with with real people if I can, and I did it. I did give it to a young man with commitment problems to see what he thought, of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I got two useful comments. One of them was, "Don't say what in the fuck, say what the fuck." Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> 
that checks out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the other one is was that is not how you smoke a joint. <laughs> So it's good to check these things out, but 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 what do we know about the teenage slang of the future? Right, we we don't. We don't. Yeah. So how do you make it sound like a teenage person using a vernacular that doesn't exist yet? So it was pulled off quite beautifully in a Clockwork Orange. But he's but he's going. That's that's really where he's going. He's going for the language. The whole thing, in a way, it's about the language. Right. So I, I wanted a sprinkling of it. But how much was too much, and how much was just over? You know. So that was my problem. It was it was with the slang. My follow up to that is, which of the three was easiest to write? You're a meanie. <laughs> well, I bring it up because I can tell you, much to my horror, which was the easiest for me to read. <laughs> you liked Aunt Lydia. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. Um. <laughs> it's a, and it's a, you'll pardon me, it's a real mind fuck. This book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the was reason she the you easiest liked to write? Aunt Lydia the best was probably is that she is the best read. Mm. She has her own That's little right. stash of books that are for, forbidden in the culture at large, such as Jane Eyre. And, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she, therefore, has a more literary vocabulary than the others, and she, has, uh, she is uh, much more able to see people's evil motivations uh, than the others are, partly because she's experienced them, but partly because she has also read a lot more novels. There's nothing that lets you into the secret of people's motivations uh, like reading novels. It's better than movies, it's better than TV, it's the closest you will ever come to being inside somebody else's head. And that's my, that's my uh, spiel about novels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, so she can quote things, whereas the others kind of can't. And then you replicate this experience for the readers who, reading this novel, find themselves deep in the head of Aunt Lydia. And a winding labyrinth it is. <laughs> She's also very funny. She's hilariously funny. Um, <clears throat> okay. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to do one more. Um, this is like getting a door prize. Sorry. <laughs> um, there are some downer totalitarian questions in here, let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> How would you keep from feeling hopeless in Gilead? How would I personally? Mm -hmm. Or how would a person? The question is, how would you, Margaret Atwood? Oh, I'd be doing the secret diary, no question, and hiding it in little corners. So the value is not only, that gets back to this question of the, the value of telling women's stories. The value mm -hmm. is not simply for those who hear them the value is also for those who are finally telling them. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of questions in my life about writer's block. And what do you do about writer's block? And usually that person is afraid of the page because they're afraid of, of other people disapproving of them. So what I say is nobody's going to see this unless you allow them to. So let it rip. Just do it. You can always put it in the waste paper basket if you don't like it, but you're not going to know whether you like it or not until you do it. So that is the value for the person writing it, is, is getting it out to an imaginary reader, but that imaginary reader can become a real reader Possibly. 
Is there any application for this where we are currently in the stage where, as you say, we're trying to prevent the installation of a theocracy that is as punishing and severe as Gilead? What, because I bet that this question was asked, as it is asked by many people all the time, what should we be doing now to feel hope and to be taking steps to prevent this? Okay, in a writing way or in another way? In any way. In any way, okay. So you're already doing it. I'm, 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 I hear of and have spoken with lots of people who are already doing this. I, I spoke today to, to people who are doing a lot of work countering uh, voter suppression. Mm -hmm. You know, they're out there doing it. The people doing the climate march are doing it. They're sending a strong signal. You still have the power and the ability to do this. The, the problem comes because a lot of people have jobs and they are afraid of getting fired if they um, express themselves too vehemently in these directions. But luckily in this country, the vote is still a secret thing. Yeah? So keep it that way. Mm -hmm. It's a very snoopy society right now. There's a lot of surveillance. Um, but, but let us hope that voting still remains a private act. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things are happening. There are people working away at, at them. Uh, and that should inspire you with a lot of hope and jolly feelings. Uh, and we we did note what happened in the last um, election. Yes. Where the uh, people who were not the people that you were worried about got control of the House of Representatives. That did happen. It did. It would be great if they used their oversight power. But... Um, <laughs> So engagement, communication, participation, all of those not things. Not giving up. Uh, yes, all of those things. Uh, with a, with a, um, I think we should all go back and read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm. It's a very grounding document, and dependent on it is the Declaration of Women's Rights, and also dependent on it is the Declaration of, of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things are pretty important because this big ball of wax we're talking about is not compartmentalized. It's not climate emergency over here, women's rights over here, indigenous rights over here. They're, they're all part of, of one big picture, which is the story of, hu of the human race on this planet. And we are at the point where those things cannot be regarded as separate and compartmentalized. We are at the end. I. <laughs> it's not the end yet. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for committing your act. <laughs> it's glorious. For your hope for the future, writing your stories, imagining the future reader, the faith in our future, um, for awakening the political consciousness, me and millions of other people, and for answering and taking, deciding ultimately to answer the questions of so many readers and, um, to ta and taking them further into this world. I thank you so much, and I thank you so much for being here tonight, and I thank, thank you, you all so much. Thank you.